Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name is Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. We're glad that you have tuned in to uh, this time of worship. Uh, we'll begin today with our scripture passage, which is from Romans chapter four, verses 13 through 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who have the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into things, being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Let us pray. Wonderful, gracious God, we pray your blessing over the hearing and uh, reading and understanding of these words as we enter into this time. Uh, speak to us, guide us, lead us, open our hearts to the words that you have for us. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, there was a, a, a word that kept popping up in the scripture and it's this word righteous. Um, and in the scripture, it's, it's lifted up as something to attain to, and it's obviously from the way Paul talks in not only this passage, but throughout the book of Romans, that he's pretty uh, impressed and persuaded uh, by this idea of righteousness. You can see that it's something that Paul attains to, uh, something that he strives for, uh, something that he desires, would love to be righteous and stand next to uh, 
uh, Abraham uh, in the sort of hall of fame of faith. Uh, and that, that can be a trap uh, to uh, want something uh, that much, uh, but Paul does a good job of explaining what this righteousness is and how we get there and, and what it's all about. Um, the, the word connects uh, for religious people, righteousness is something that uh, a lot of folks that have been in church for a long time hear and, and kind of sort of mostly understand. Uh, it is a little preachy. Now, I'm not sure all of us want to be uh, righteous. Uh, we maybe use a different adjective. Uh, but the, the average Roman citizen to whom Paul is also writing uh, probably wouldn't connect so much with this word. They're, being righteous is probably not something they're walking around thinking about. Uh, so Paul is writing to both camps. He's writing to uh, the unchurched folks in, in Rome uh, and everywhere else, uh, but he's also writing to the church. And he's trying to put these ideas together in a way that all of us can understand uh, and see the trappings of and the struggles of. Uh, so maybe we wouldn't use the word righteous. But we're all striving for something. We're all looking forward. We're all uh, seeking something. People today would probably say they're striving for uh, feeling worthy, uh, maybe for measuring up, maybe for feeling valued or feeling valuable, uh, f feeling that way about ourselves, but also wanting others around us to value uh, us too. So we worry that we're not going to become successful, we're not going to become, say, happy, we're not going to become good enough, uh, we're not going to make something of our lives. And, and depending on our age, maybe we think about that more than uh, other times. Uh, if we're younger, maybe that's not something we're thinking a whole lot about, but as we get older, we kind of look back and wonder uh, what our lives uh, have meant. Wonder if you uh, are familiar with the Steve McQueen movie, I'm, I'm kind of dating myself here, uh, called Papillon. In that movie, Steve McQueen is a career criminal. And one night he goes to sleep, he has a dream, he's standing before the judge, and the judge says that you are guilty of the worst crime imaginable. And Steve McQueen's character, Papillon, says, and what would that be? And the judge says, a wasted life. Wow, uh, that hits pretty hard. I think sometimes we get to the point, and maybe in different places in life, where we, we wonder, what does our life count for? What will it count for? What has it count, counted for, depending on our perspective? So the first four chapters of the book of Romans uh, kind of talk about this, talk about uh, who we are, who we're becoming, and how we're going to get there. What's the path we're going to follow? What's the voice we're going to listen to? Whose uh, advice are we going to take? And so Paul does a fun job of, of sort of holding in tension the, the world and faith, uh, law and grace, slavery and freedom, uh, and he weaves those ideas together in sort of a tapestry that helps us look at ourselves uh, and also look at this idea of Abraham. Abraham is lifted up here uh, uh, by Paul as, uh, as sort of the standard bearer for our faith. If we could all just be like Abraham. It, it's clear that Paul reveres Abraham a lot uh, as uh, the, one of, if not the uh, most important person uh, in our faith next to, to Jesus. And so, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure who that person is for you, who that person is that you revere, that you point to, that you look like, that you try to emulate uh, in your life, who you try to, to copy. Um, but it's, it's clear that Paul is starting from this uh, person of Abraham to try to talk to all of us about how life can work uh, in the eyes of God, what, what God's looking for from us and how we can uh, live a life that, that turns out uh, closer to what we're striving for. And so 
uh, Paul talks early uh, in the first and second chapter about the world, uh, the world around us and the people that make up this world and what they're living for and what they look like. And, and, and he, he, he kind of paints a picture of people just pleasing themselves, doing everything they can. Uh, but they're on a mission to be successful, to be happy, to be hopeful. Uh, but the, the, the things they choose to do, Paul lists as, as really not very uh, helpful. Uh, the way of the world is the way of human understanding. We've got to try to figure everything out on our own. We don't need any help. We don't need anybody. We don't need God. Uh, we don't need uh, anything but ourselves and our own mind and the things we can figure out. And as Paul is in Rome, uh, that's kind of the epicenter of that day of, of uh, human understanding and science and growth and, and uh, figuring everything out. On the other side, Paul comes from a very faithful background. He's, he's been a Jew all of his life. Uh, he's learned uh, all of the laws and the rules, uh, and faith looks at life um, and, and presents a different picture of life and what it's about and what it means to be successful uh, than what the world does. Faith doesn't start with humanity. Faith starts with God. Faith looks at the world as God breathed and God created. And so Paul's going to say that whichever path we choose, uh, the temptation and the biggest struggle is becoming slaves to that view of life uh, and of way, the, the way forward. We either become slaves to sin, uh, we get caught up in, in doing things that, uh, that bring pleasure, uh, and those things uh, eventually lead to a sort of a destruction because we've become slaves to it, and it eats up and destroys everything else around it. Or... Uh, which is a really interesting idea, we become slaves to the law, that the, our religious faith can also be a trap, and that we can become slaves to this law so that the law is more important than the relationship with God, and, and more important than even to listening with God. We're so busy trying to do what we think makes us righteous that we, we don't spend enough time uh, understanding the person of God and the relationship with God, and, um, and that also leads to destruction. He says, Paul says, neither of them lead to what we want. Neither of them lead to freedom and for peace, joy, and grace. Uh, so, Abraham, again, is lifted up as this model. Uh, Abraham didn't strive to be uh, all-knowing as a human, and Abraham also didn't strive uh, to uh, uh, keep the law better than anyone else in all of the world. In fact, as you look at the, the, the person of Abraham, Abraham made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of crazy, silly things. So Paul is not, again, Paul's not saying all of this to condemn us, to beat us over the head, to uh, condemnation. In fact, is the last thing uh, on Paul's mind. He's had a, a good bit of that early in his life, and he's had this transformation, and he's moving away from that. Paul would uh, say that he knows better than anyone how these chains of enslavement of the law and of life uh, can uh, create havoc and calamities in in the ways in which we live out our lives. Paul is going to talk about uh, the literal slaves in Egypt, and he's going to talk about how we become slaves to sin or slaves to the law. Uh, he will talk about how we even choose uh, to become slaves and live in, that, uh, in those shackles. Again, Paul is, is following the understanding uh, that was prevalent in that area of uh, the thought of Aristotle, uh, where uh, Aristotle taught that if you could, uh, in the first century, uh, th that if, you could, if we could just enlighten people, if we could just teach them, uh, they would move into the direction of the light. Um, they would choose to do uh, what is right. 
Uh, but Paul is going to come alongside of that and say, yeah, but the, the trappings of that uh, tend to enslave us. We get so compelled on looking at the rules and the laws for doing what's right, for instance, uh, that we become obsessed with the things that we do instead of the relationship that we have. Um, so in chapters 1 and 2, Paul talks about this heathen, godless culture. Uh, those who have turned their back on God. He describes the wretchedness of their actions, and, and he points to how evil uh, they can be. Um, they, they aren't like Abraham at all. And you know, <laughs> sometimes that just needs to be said. Um, too often, we hide things. Uh, we protect family members or friends. Uh, we turn the other cheek. We don't really want to know what's going on, so we pretend that it doesn't exist. Paul won't let us pretend. He names it. Sometimes we really do need to name it. Decent people often say nothing. So Paul just throws it out there to talk about the, the struggles in the world. Well, and, and uh, I, I'm struggling with that a little bit right now in, in my life. Sherry and I just got a puppy. Uh, Stella is uh, just a rescue dog. Uh, she's about 12 weeks old. Um, and it's been a long time since Sherry and I have had a, a puppy and worked with a puppy, training the puppy. And so uh, most of the puppy guides today talk about treats and rewards and how to encourage your puppy to the best behavior uh, by positive reinforcement. Um, well, um, that, that, that's not always easy. Uh, sometimes, like the other day, uh, the puppy got into the cat litter box because she was looking for a mid-morning treat. I know, that's disgusting. But the worst part was that she came up and jumped in my lap and licked my face uh, right after that as if to say, hey, guess what I did? Well, it was the most disgusting smell I'd ever smelled. And um, she's like, so my reaction to the puppy wasn't one of treating good behavior with rewards. In fact, uh, it was just the opposite. Now, I don't know how helpful that'll be in, in training, but my hope is that she won't forget uh, the reaction that, that she got from me uh, after doing that. Well, that's, that's kind of what Paul is struggling with here, is uh, naming, calling out uh, the sin. Um, and so it's at this point, and this is how Paul just does such a great job of just kind of holding in tension uh, the world and the world of faith. Because you can see, you can sense in the... Uh, first two chapters that the Christians and the, uh, the Jews who are reading this and hearing this and listening to Paul and uh, hearing this are going, yeah, isn't that what we do? We, we point to the evil around us and we go, yeah, those people, yeah, those people, yeah, Paul, good job, tell them, tell them what they need to know, uh, go after them, yeah, we're cheering on uh, the criticism of folks who aren't like us. Um, and so, but then Paul says, but you know, in chapter 3, when we get to chapter 3, Paul says, but you know, those of us in the church, we, we do the same thing. <laughs> we act the same way. Uh, we, we take the law and uh, create something that was never supposed to be. We become slaves to it, and that robs us of the grace and the love with which we need to be treating people. We run around condemning and criticizing instead of loving and caring. Uh, Paul looks at the church and the church leaders and says, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. And that also is sometimes hard to say. Um, and, and it's something that's always hard to say. We, we can't seem to do that much today. We can't seem to look at our own stuff uh, and see that we're part of the problem. All of us uh, have different parts to play in the problems that, uh, that plague us. It's not just one side that is wrong. Uh, it really takes all of us, and we all share the blame. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul is mainly talking 
talking to the church when he says there is no one righteous. No, not even one. No one righteous, not even one. And so, uh, in, again, in chapter 3, 10 through 11, um, and then 12 through 18, Paul really goes after uh, the church to uh, talk about uh, their failings and uh, how they have used religion as a way to promote their own self, uh, to get ahead, to take advantage of people, to do dastardly things. And he says, look, uh, church, you're, you're not really uh, knocking it out of the park your, yourself. No one is righteous, not even one. So I, uh, Paul weaves this story in the first three and four chapters of uh, Romans talking about that uh, the world hasn't figured out the answer, the church hasn't quite figured out the answer, at least in, in the practice of that early church. And so as you listen today, I, I wonder you may be feeling burdened, hurt, discouraged, uh, about your attempts to please God, to make life work, to work your way into heaven, to work your way into a right relationship with God. Maybe you don't feel victory in your faith. Maybe you feel uh, that things have ended up short of the goal that you have. Where do you feel the pressure to be good enough? Is it in school? making the grades, uh, getting a good start in life, not disappointing your parents? Have you done your best? Could you have done more? Maybe in, in your marriage, uh, working hard to make your spouse happy, satisfied, fulfilled, complete, are you doing your best? Could you have done more? Maybe in your career, Maybe as you read these words from Paul, you recognize, gosh, I could have done this and I could have done that. Uh, where could I have done better? Where could I have worked harder? Maybe as a parent, you hear these words that uh, uh, maybe you've uh, tried to please yourself and, and not been as selfless in being a parent as you could have been. Uh, have you done all you can? Is there a chance someone would nominate you for parent of the year, what else could you have done? And it, it's at this point um, when the, we read the Bible and the, 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 the Bible becomes almost a, a weapon against us, and it's never intended to be that uh, do, because we hear these words and, and, and because they do resonate us with us, none of us measure up. Not even one. And it's at this point that a lot of times people, good people, uh, hear this whisper in our head, you don't measure up. You're a loser. You're no good. We hear that whisper. I know, I know that we do. I, I hear that whisper. I've been an awful husband, an awful father, a miserable preacher, a, a sorry friend. I don't measure up in so many ways. So, so when we hear that, feel that, experience that, what, what do we do? Well, we cry out. We sink in despair. We stare at a wall and wonder how to turn it all around. We, we try harder. And that's just Paul's point. We, we try harder. Uh, that takes either faith or our worldview and turns it back onto ourselves and says, we are in charge. We're the most important. We are the most powerful. We can do this. We have to do this. We look to ourselves for the answers. And that's where Paul says, it's not what Abraham did, and that's not the goal. We ask ourselves, am I lovable? Am I worthy? Am I valued? Is there any hope? Remember in the passage we read, against all hope, Abraham believed. It, it, it wasn't because it made sense. It wasn't because uh, he was taught that. It was this connection that he had with God and the relationship with God. He'd given up everything to God. And it's at this moment when we're at that point of struggle and battle and wondering what to do and not knowing where to turn that Satan has us right where he wants us to be. We're putty in his hands. We are a loathsome pile of 
pity and snot. We're on the verge of giving up, cashing it in, wallowing in our own despair. We'll never measure up to what God, to, we'll never measure up to the good we attain to. Paul says in this third chapter, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and that can be a point of despair, but, but Max Lucado, the great Christian speaker and writer, author, uh, says, says this about this passage. For 61 verses in Romans, we have sat with Paul in a darkened room as he's described the fatality of sin. Every candle is down to the wick. Every lamp is empty of oil. There is a hearth but it is, has no wood. There's a lantern, but no flame. We have groped in every corner and found no light, unable to see even our hand before our faces. All we can do is stare into the night. We are unaware that Paul has crept next to the window and he's placed his hand on the latch. And just when we wonder if there is any light to be found, Paul throws open the shutters and announces, but God does have a way. God does have a way. And that's what Paul points to in the life of Abraham, uh, that Abraham didn't try to figure it all out on his own. He, he, he didn't try to figure out the universe and declare what it was or, or what it wasn't. Uh, Abraham didn't try to be righteous. Uh, he didn't calculate all the goals and the steps and try to figure it out. He simply trusted God. He believed God and he began to walk and build a relationship. And, and Abraham, more than most of us, uh, made mistakes. But those mistakes he made were in pursuing this relationship with God. I think Jesus was thinking of Abraham when he said in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and then everything else will work out. I pray that in, in your life, maybe, maybe we're working too hard, struggling too hard, worrying too much, anxious uh, too much of the time. It, it, it's not the easiest thing to trust in God, but it's, it's the best thing. Let us pray. God, I thank you for the, the witness uh, of Paul and the struggle over this dilemma of uh, how to pursue life and the different voices that we hear around us in Paul's day, really uh, not very different from our day. We can get trapped into uh, trying to, to do everything ourselves and, and relying and trusting on our own selves. But we can also make our faith uh, a legal nightmare, trying to cross every T and dot every I and, and, and pursue righteousness based on our works. So we have to do it. We have to uh, figure it all out. Instead of God, our putting our trust in you. Guide us. Give us strength. Give us good friends to help us along the way. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you today as we go forward. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. 
Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.